I'd like to welcome everyone to this Cody webinar, Global Decisions with Local Impact, what COP26 means for vulnerable communities. Thank you for joining from around the world for this session. I would like to begin by acknowledging the Indigenous peoples of all the lands that we are on today. While we meet on a virtual platform, it remains important to acknowledge the lands on which we live and call home. Here in Canada, from coast to coast to coast, we, we acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of all the Inuit, Métis, and First Nations people that call this land home. Here in Nova Scotia and at the Cody Institute, I would like to specifically acknowledge that we are in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. We acknowledge this land not only in thanks to the Indigenous communities who have held relationship with it for generations, but also in recognition of the historical and ongoing legacy of colonialism in Canada and around the world. My name is Eric Smith, and I'm the Cody Project Manager for Engage, Women's Empowerment and Active Citizenship. Engage is a five-year project co-designed by Cody and five partners, the Self-Employed Women's Association in India, the Organization for Women in Self-Employment in Ethiopia, the Tanzanian Jet Gender Networking Platform, the Christian Commission for Development in Bangladesh, and the Haitian Center for Leadership and Excellence. It is being undertaken with the financial support of Global Affairs Canada and applies an asset-based community development approach to promote gender equitable change. It also has a rich learning agenda to share and promote knowledge and lessons learned. And this webinar is part of that. We're grateful to be joined by our speakers today who will share their experiences with COP26 and more. They are in no particular order other than left to right as they appear on my screen. Um, Gregoire Baribo. Greg is from Environment and Climate Change Canada and is Canada's lead negotiator on the Paris Agreement's Article 6 on carbon markets. And he previously negotiated the nationally determined contributions guidance of the Paris Agreement. He also sits on the International Civil Aviation Organization's technical body looking at offsets for airlines. Today, Greg will be speaking in a personal capacity and not on behalf of the Government of Canada. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Sham Sudoha is the Chief Executive Officer of the Centre for Participatory Research and Development in Bangladesh. Doha Bai uh, and his organization are researchers and influencers of policymakers, especially for climate justice for the most vulnerable. He has a focus on climate change migration and slow onset events, the secondary impacts of climate change on women, and adaptation gaps and how to address these. Mihir Bhatt is the executive director of the All India Disaster Mitigation Institute. Mihir Bhai was one of the lead co-authors of the IPC special report on managing the climate risks of extreme events and disasters. In this capacity, he led case studies on the ground and helped coordinate 80 scientists. He and his organization have implemented those findings in cities, coastal communities, and more to respond to extreme heat events, impacts of climate change on community development, and to assess climate risk. And our final panelist is, um, is Mega, Mega Desai, who is a senior coordinator with the Self-Employed Women's Association. Mega Ben has been with SEWA for 14 years and is a lead on SEWA's agricultural work and has led programs on rebuilding lives after war and disaster across South Asia. She leads SEWA's National Farmer Forum Network and on behalf of SEWA is also a director of the Bees Regional Network on Business, Enterprise and Employment Support. We are also joined by Dr. Kareen Cash, who is Assistant Professor of Planning and Community Climate Change Adaptation at Mount Allison University. She is also an adjunct, adjunct prof, professor at St. FX and was formerly cross-appointed between St. FX's Climate and Environment Program and the Cody Institute, where she led our Resilient Communities thematic area. Kareen currently facilitates Cody's Climate Change Basics for Community Resilience course. Kareen will be moderating our session today. So a big thank you and, uh, and a virtual round of applause to all of our, um, all of our panelists and our moderator, Kareen. An additional thanks to Mansi Shah of Sewa, who is providing simultaneous translation in Gujarati for our Sewa sisters. Um, so that said, big thank you to our panelists, Greg, Mihirbai, Dohabai, and Mega Ben for joining us today. I'm looking forward to the discussion and appreciate everyone's time. Uh, Kareen, thanks to you, and over to you to introduce, introduce the topics of conversation and begin the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Good morning, everyone. Um, from a very snowy East Coast, Canada, um, we, we had a lot of snow last night, so it's one would maybe 
maybe wonder um, what's happening with with the climate change here in the in the east. We typically have a lot of um, freezing rain and sea level rise and and uh, really different kind of winters. Um, sometimes a lot of snow, sometimes a lot of rain. It's, it's a touch and go. So um, many of you have perhaps heard about the, the COP process. Um, I know some of you are experts on COP. Others are perhaps new to COP because we have a wide variety of uh, participants in this webinar today. I would like to... Uh, start with Gregoire, I have a question for him. Um, I'm interested in perhaps he could tell us a little bit about COP, what it is, and uh, just, just so that everyone is aware of, of the negotiation process and what it means. So that's, what, that's our starting point today. So Gregoire, do you wanna go ahead? Yes, uh, thanks, Corinne, and uh, good uh, morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, I've actually prepared, I, have a, I want to keep this informal, but I've prepared a few slides just to maybe help, help illustrate some of the key um, things about the COP. So if you bear with me, I will share my screen right now um, and start the slideshow. From beginning, can you see my slides? Can I get a thumbs up from from somebody? Yes, you could see your slide. Wonderful. Um, so it, again, it's just a couple of slides to maybe uh, set the scene. Um, I know some of you are are experts on on the COP and and climate negotiations, but others might be coming from with other expertise. Um, so this first slide just sort of uh, makes a little bit of a distinction of the two main UN. United Nations bodies that deal with climate change. Um, so on, on the left, you have the scientists of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, that's the IPCC. And, and they basically say what's, what's going on and, and what can be done about it. Um, and these, these findings are, are published. They have regular assessment reports every seven years, um, occasional special reports. Um, and in fact, the, uh, the, the latest assessment report, uh, group one, the what is happening, the, the physical science basis came out uh, late last year and the uh, version two and three will be coming out next year. Um, so that's the, the climate science, that's the evidence. Um, and then on the right hand side, you have uh, the policy wonks at the, uh, at the UNFCCC. And, um, and we sort of haggle over, okay, well, here's what's going on and what can be done. And, and we ask, okay, well, what will be done? What will we agree to do? And uh, who does what and, and, and who, uh, who pays for it? Um, so the COP is, is part of the UNFCCC process on the right, uh, whereas the IPCC, they send delegates to the COP, but they have a separate set of meetings on, on climate science. Um, so this second slide is about the Paris Agreement um, and just highlighting maybe some key pieces of it. Um, and so you can often divide it into four pillars. Um, I think there's 29 articles of the agreement. Um, but the, the, the four main topics that are addressed, uh, the first is mitigation. Um, and that's about reducing emissions and, and increasing removals of, of greenhouse gases in order to meet the long-term temperature goal. Um, and then the second to topic is adaptation, and that's about, about dealing with, with the changing climate that is beyond the limits of mitigation. So about the climate change that we cannot stop or, or mitigate. Um, and also to a, a growing extent about loss and damage, which is about dealing with the effects of climate change. They're even beyond our ability to adapt and to build resilience. Um, next, you have the, the transparency and compliance provisions, and that's sorry to keep track of what everyone's doing and, you know, what are the carrots and sticks that are used to, to get them to follow the agreement. Um, and then finally, support, and it's support for all three of those things above that, that you have support for mitigation, you have support for adaptation, and then you also have support for, for transparency to help countries get better data, for example. Um, and support comes in, in different forms. Uh, the most common are, are finance, which is money, uh, capacity building, um, and, and technology transfer. Um, so that's sort of the, the four main pieces of the agreement. In terms of what happens at, at a COP, um, you can really divide it into two tracks. And I have some photos to give you an idea 
of what that looks like. Um, so on the left of your screen, you have the, the negotiations, um, which lead to decisions that are adopted in, in the plenary rooms. And, and to get to a decision, you have different levels of rooms and different levels of, of documents. Um, so I spend most of my time at, at the lower levels in the technical rooms. And, and you get into each room and then each country will say what it wants. And then the chair or the facilitator of that room, uh, their job is to produce a document that reflects what she or, or he heard. Um, and then you go, you go back into the room a few hours later and the different delegates will react to the document, um, say what they like and don't like. And, and if together they can live with it, at least as a basis for further work, then uh, the document gets more status and maybe it gets punted to uh, a more important room and gets bundled with other documents until eventually you reach the main plenary and get the final decisions. Um, meanwhile, on the right of your screen, you have all this other stuff, um, mostly to help either build momentum in the negotiations or, or to work on, on different climate policy problems outside of the negotiations. And so you have both high level, you know, leaders level events. Uh, there are 120 leaders at, at the COP. Um, and you also have very technical level events with scientists and activists and so on. Um, in fact, there's an entire trade show floor where countries have uh, and organizations have pavilions uh, that you can visit. Um, and just to give a sense of scale, uh, COP26 had just over 39,000 delegates and perhaps maybe 3,000 were uh, directly involved in the negotiations. So to a considerable extent, the side events have become the, the main event. Um, so why is it so difficult for countries to agree? Uh, we've been negotiating for 26 years um, and, and that will no doubt continue. Um, and, and I have two sort of explanations. Um, so the first is kind of the where you stand depends on where you sit. Um, and if you look at those three sorry, questions that the UNFCCC is tasked to answer, and then the different circumstances of, of the countries at the table, um, you can imagine how each one will have a very different answer to each one of those questions. Um, and just to underline that a lot of this isn't really about ideology, um, it's about national circumstances. Um, there are 200 countries in the negotiations Many of them have changes of government from time to time, um, but the overall positions change maybe a little bit less than you think. Uh, a second way to look at it is this concept called two-level game theory. Um, and this is from the perspective of the negotiator from in this diagram, countries A and B, uh, any resemblance to actual national flags is purely coincidence. Um, and so each negotiator um, that you see with the flags on, the, on their chest, they sit at two different tables uh, simultaneously. Uh, we have our, our international table in the middle at the United Nations, um, but then we also have our respective domestic tables. And, and any agreement that will succeed at the international level needs to be acceptable to a critical mass of, of domestic tables or else your, your national government or other actors in your country will force your country, uh, will force the deal apart. Um, so in many ways, uh, diplomats are kind of liaisons um, between the domestic and the international level. Um, I represent Canada's values and interests abroad, but then at home, I try to sensitize my own government uh, and, and, you know, uh, and Canadians to this external perspective to try to bring those points of view together. Um, so this is my last slide before I, I, I turn it back to the group. Um, this is just highlighting some of the key outcomes at, at COP26 along these, these two tracks. Um, so briefly on the, on the negotiations track, there were really five, uh, I think, things that were most prominently came out of, of the negotiations. Uh, you had reporting tables um, and templates for, for countries' greenhouse gas emissions and their progress towards their targets. Um, that's sort of the, the transparency uh, compliance piece. Um, you have the rules for carbon markets, which I negotiated uh, in particular to prevent double counting. Um, you had NDC timeframes, which is the, uh, the next greenhouse gas targets 
um, after 2030 uh, for most countries will be 2035 uh, targets, and then these will be published in 2025. Um, and then you had some new discussions on, on the global adaptation goal uh, and the global finance goals. Um, happy to get into details on that. And then finally, we initiated a dialogue on, on funding arrangements for, for loss and damage. For a long time, the idea of talking about financing for loss and damage, uh, some countries thought that was maybe a bit early. Um, and so it is maybe reflects a shift in attitude there. And then on the political side, of course, this was the first big climate conference in, in a couple of years and much has happened. Uh, you had new climate targets from many countries, though not all. Uh, you had new climate finance pledges, mostly from developed countries. Um, and then you had a variety of political declarations about specific actions, as well as commitments from uh, some corporate leaders. Um, so I think that's maybe the bird's eye view of what happened at COP. And with that, I'll turn the uh, uh, table back to the uh, uh, to the chair. Well, thank you very much, Gregoire. Um, I think that I'd like to address each of the panelists now that we have a background about COP26. And I just want to focus on a very, you know, a fundamental basic level, just so that our, our audience can, can understand what different places are facing around the world. Uh, what I want to connect, you know, the, the high level negotiations with what's actually happening to, to real to real people on the ground. So um, I think that I will start with Doha. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the, the um, how climate change is impacting the communities uh, and, and other issues in your country around climate change? Well, thank you very much. And thank you very much for your nice presentation, uh, because this is about comprehensive understanding and COP. When we attend COP and also uh, discuss about COP, then essentially we try to communicate our local level vulnerabilities, vulnerabilities to the global communities so that global communities are sensitized and they become proactive to address the impacts of climate change. Uh, if I consider Bangladesh, you know Bangladesh is a frequently cited country in international journal and also international speech. Uh, even our prime minister talks about climate change, climate change impact. And the major issue that come up, this is displacement and migration. And you know that displacement and migration is closely related to loss and damage and uh, impacts of climate change. And if I consider the impacts of climate change, uh, 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 you know that Bangladesh is a country of disasters. And sometimes it, people call say that Bangladesh is a nature, nature's laboratory of disasters. So there are all types of disasters except the volcanic eruption, and all disasters are linked to weather. So any changes in weather will lead to uh, increase of disaster events in terms of frequency or also intensity. And uh, sometimes people say that Bangladesh floods on, I mean Bangladesh flood on water. So we need to receive water from the upstream, and also we receive water during summer. So. Uh, in the context of climate change, uh, the total weather pattern have changed. So we are facing more cyclone, more intense cyclone, floods in summer, and also in other uh, other time, floods flood. Floods are related to, uh, it causes landslide. In northern part of the country, there is scarcity of rainfall or precipitation. This is lead to drought. So the scenario of climate change impact is not unique. This is different impacts in different areas. And uh, sometimes we also uh, would like to say that we are a pioneer, or in, a pioneer in terms of addressing disasters, but what kind of disasters we can address? These are absolutely uh, sudden onset disasters, not the slow onset disasters. But in the context of climate change, in Bangladesh, we are facing increased number of slow onset disasters, climate processes, like salinity intrusion, like uh, salinity, salinity intrusion also causes uh, uh, also causes water logging, logging of saline water. It also causes loss of productivity. So uh, the Bangladesh is now struggling to cope or even understand what are the impacts of slow on onset events. And essentially, we know that the impacts of slow onset events are inequality, poverty, 
um, and also displacement or migration. And they also are closely linked to human rights and also rights of the women, rights of marginalized community people, rights of indigenous community people. So uh, I, I'm, I'm telling about women in, in that context that women take this shared responsibility in our social context and cultural, cultural context to support family members in terms of livelihood earning, in terms of uh, affording water, I mean, drinking water. But in this north, southern part of the country, the entire uh, fresh water source has become saline due to sea level rise and also other, other development problems. So women sometimes consume saline water to save fresh water for other family members. They also uh, take the burden of fetching water maybe from 1,100 kilometers from their household. So the, the impacts of climate change to the women are differentiated, and they are closely linked, linked to human rights. But when we talk about addressing climate change, we often ignore that link. We often ignore human rights violation. We often ignore the differentiated impacts of uh, climate change to women and also indigenous communities, community people. I'd like to stop here. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Doha. I, I'd like to um, uh, turn it over to me here uh, to talk about the vulnerabilities that you are seeing uh, within your own uh, communities within your country. Yeah. So um, I'd like to add to what Samsud Doha said in his presentation about Bangladesh, and I'll build on that and not repeat because a lot of things that he said is also common to India and other parts of South Asia. Um, I'd like to say that when we were part of um, IPCC's special report on extreme event, it was at that time, 2014, not clear how some of the findings will actually unfold. And I'll pick up two of those findings and say that how quickly, how quickly it's going to unfold, it is unfolding. And one of them is the heat wave. And I'm not reducing entire climate change impact into one hazard, but I want to use that as an example. And the number of heat wave bouts in a given summer are increasing in India. The number of cities affected by heat wave each year again are increasing. The number of population that is affected by heat waves, both in urban areas and rural areas, is increasing. The economic sectors that are affected by heat wave in the last 10 years are also increasing and may it be something as obvious as the work that informal sector workers do on the streets as street vendors selling food, vegetables, water, but also something which is not very easy to imagine is to the storage uh, and logistics sector where they need far more air conditioned supply chain related arrangements than they have had before. Further, uh, things are not as all bad, and I'm very happy to report that large number of people, including the poor and vulnerable, are making efforts to address this climate change related hardships that they are facing. And some of them are very small and individual, and that is women adding an additional roof on their rooftop to make sure that uh, the heat is reduced when it comes inside large number of houses are doing whitewash on the terrace to make sure that the heat is reflected and the house and the house remains cool and that's very important because as you know in the low income communities large number of families use their house also as a workplace similarly uh, the cities are making effort and the city that i come from Ahmedabad has made an effort to address the heat wave situation by providing early warning so two or three days ago, you directly get a SMS, a text message, either WhatsApp or other, which also gives you a very clear indication that how is it going to affect you in the next two days, what the heat levels will be. And you can plan your day, day accordingly 
the schools have changed their school timing so that the children don't have to leave the school in the middle of the three o'clock, four o'clock afternoon heat, for example. Um, uh, and that's how the municipal corporation of Ahmedabad has made a heat wave action plan with a large number of organizations jointly working. And further, they are also going to ask that what is it that they are doing, uh, which the municipal corporation can tell other cities. And I'm very happy to involve that from one city within Gujarat, three more cities picked up the heat wave action planning. And from the state of Gujarat, large number of uh, other cities in other states, such as the uh, uh, Chhattisgarh, for example, has picked up the heat wave action plan and cities are making such plans. So what I would like to say that uh, on one hand, the impact of climate change on the life and livelihoods of the people, especially poor and vulnerable, is tremendous. On the other hand, the effort that they are doing to address this impact by adapting to making small changes in their life, in their house, in their environment, is also tremendous. So how do we reconcile both. So impact is less and the measures that people are taking on their own are supported and accelerated. That's the challenge that we are facing here, both as a country and we as an individual organization as well. Thank you, Corin, for this uh, opportunity. Thank you, Mihir. And finally, Mega, uh, would you like to, to speak to this? Sure. Um, thank you very much, Corin Ben. Uh, distinguished guest, fellow panelists, and dear participants. Namaste, good evening, afternoon, and morning. Um, we heard from uh, Doha Bhai and Mihir Bhai about the challenges that uh, uh, are faced by women and in general. Today, I am going to talk about uh, the specific impact of this climate change on women of informal sector. So it's been almost a month now that the India has pledged net zero 2070 commitments at COP26, but there is a little discussion on how informal sector workers, uh, through they though they constitute 81% of the workforce and specifically women who contribute towards mitigation of the climate change effects and general livelihood is not uh, seen in that. Um, these women are economically active, which may emit uh, carbon, but they face unequal burden of climate change, despite their minimal contribution to emission. The impact of climate change is larger on small and marginal farmers, as they are struggling daily with the smallest change in climate we heard in uh, presentation of Doha by similar are faced by our women as well. The increasing fre uh, frequent climate shocks and without any protection, um, it is making livelihoods of millions of uh, informal sector workers unsustainable and unviable. Their food security is at stake. So we at SEVA organizes women workers of informal sector to bring out their voice visibility and validate their actions um, of even though they are small, yet so many informal sector women workers. So today we are force of 1.9 million women workers across 18 states of India, um, who works for the twin objective of full employment and self-reliance. Our founder, Sri Ilaben Bhatt says, we are human, animal, trees, birds, air, water, all objects in universe are bound to each other and form oceanic circle, which is called Anuband. Um, take, give, conserve, preserve. The world is sustained by all correlated actions which sustain all and this Anuband is driving force for conserving the biodiversity. So uh, in 2008-9, we uh, all faced global financial crisis. Um, it has adversely impacted the informal sector women workers. And to understand income and food security conundrum, a study was uh, conducted by SEVA, which showed that almost 35 to 40% of the income of informal sector is used in accessing the energy. And during that time, the average income reduction was 60 to 70%. So in the meager incomes, um, this much percent, the larger portion was going to the um, energy. 
So uh, this helped us to um, initiate the uh, Haryali campaign, which is called the Green Livelihood Campaign at SEVA, um, which secures the um, livelihood sustainable food uh, through the wise choices of the clean energy um, and in the investment that becomes vital to nurture the work, income, food security, environment and biodiversity. Women are natural nurturers who nurture children and that's uh, children and families. And I think that helps to um, nurture the biodiversity as well and reduce the carbon footprint. So let me share some stories of our members. So Little Run of Kutch region in Gujarat is the largest producer of the India's production um, of salt with over 65,000 poor salt pen workers. So production is um, through uh, inland water pumping where diesel operated pumps are used for entire season of four months and throughout the day. So this leads to a carbon dioxide emission of approximately 13,000 kgs per year per salt pan worker. And this can be reduced emitted by switching to solar pump sets for pumping out brine. However, the initial cost of solar pumps is very high to, and access to affordable finance is challenging. So over a um, thousand farmers have started using solar pumps, but for that SEVA has to develop a program which help them access to affordable finance and to the um, clean energy equipments. So this has strengthened the livelihoods of over 70% of the um, workers. And more importantly, it has led to cumulative reduction of 13,000 tons of CO2 emission per year. Um, similarly, uh, in agriculture campaign as well, we have shifted the use of uh, uh, water, uh, the solar uh, energy equipments, which has helped reduce 62 tons of CO2 emission a year. And apart from that, we also uh, train farmers on the sustainable natural farming practices, which has also helped to reduce the expenses of about 80% and helped to reduce the emission. So um, I'll stop here and over to you, Corinne, then. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and finally, uh, Gregoire, uh, Canada is such a diverse and big country. I'm just wondering if, if you can speak to some of the impacts that we're seeing here in Canada uh, to, because climate change, as you know, is, is a global issue and it impacts all of us. Uh yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so Canada, you know, we're we're known for extreme weather and for extreme temperature ranges uh, throughout the year, um, and both our, our human and and our natural systems sort of are are very interconnected with with weather in particular. Um, so, when we think of the impacts of climate change in Canada, we often think about extreme weather events, uh, more intense storms, droughts, heat waves, uh, and forest fires. Um, we uh, we are also facing uh, impacts from from a lack of cold uh, in the winter um, because a lot of our systems rely on cold winters um, as well as challenges relating to earlier warmer weather in the spring. Um, so in my city, Ottawa, for example, we had some uh, quite extreme flooding uh, two years in a row that they say is only supposed to happen maybe once a century. Um, and it's because the, the river is fed by melting snow in the spring and the snow is the spring is coming earlier, so the snow is melting faster, uh, causing flooding. Um, in other areas of the country, you're seeing more insect plagues uh, in the forest um, because the, the natural predator of some species of insect is a cold winter um, and the, uh, the winter is, is not keeping the insect populations in check. Um, in terms of human systems, um, in addition to issues like ice storms um, and, and, and major events that affect human systems, um, there's a particular challenge for remote communities in the north, uh, which are not serviced by, by roads over land. Um, and so those communities, and there's about, uh, you know, there's a few hundred communities with, with, with well over 10,000 people living there. Um, they get their food and supplies either through their traditional economies uh, that rely on the environment 
or uh, food and supplies shipped in by ice road, which are uh, trucks that drive on frozen rivers in the winter. And so not only is the changing climate affecting the traditional economies, such as um, you know, plant and, and, and animal uh, uh, activities uh, that, that are sources of food, um, but also they're uh, shortening the ice road season so that the, the goods that are shipped in are, 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 are more expensive. Um, and so that it's, it's a very particular situation for, um, for, I guess you could say a relatively small number of people, um, but if you look at our country geographically, that's actually the majority of the country's territory that is, that is dealing with uh, those types of challenges. Thank you very much, uh, Gregoire. Um, now I would like to revisit COP26, and I'm going to ask each of the panelists to discuss what COP26 meant for their organization. So um, I will start with, uh, with Doha. Doha, do you wanna go ahead and, and talk about the, uh, how COP26 has impacted your organization or, or what it means for your organization? Uh, very, uh, very good question. And thank you very much once again for directing me first to COP26. Uh, we know that CPRD, a kind of uh, research-based think tank, we do research and policy advocacy. And in terms of policy advocacy, we, uh, I mean, the issue of what we uh, try to promote, this is climate justice and also development justice. And when we talk about climate justice, then we always try to communicate the local issues to the global stakeholders, local issues from the as I told, from the women community, from the uh, climate vulnerable communities, and also indigenous community. So particularly from COP26, as we uh, um, mass expected COP26, because that was the uh, ultimate target of uh, finalizing Paris Rulebook, because unless uh, implementation of Paris Rulebook was delayed. This way, the first circuit is to influence national policy stakeholder so that the Paris rule book is done and finalized. The other thing is that uh, there are some pressing demand from, from Bangladesh and also from other developing countries. One is loss and damage finance. And that was very critical uh, uh, in terms of Bangladesh and also other developing countries. The, uh, Gregor, uh, I mean, put loss and damage under adaptation in his slide, but in the global negotiation, Developing countries and other other country parties uh, are trying to make a standalone agenda item under loss and damage uh, under the Paris Agreement, not under the adaptation, because the connotation of uh, loss and damage and the political argument of loss and damage is something different, which is beyond of adaptation. And developing countries and also other countries uh, are trying to make loss and damage beyond the adaptation scenario. When I refer our country in Bangladesh, there are climate processes. And in many, many contexts, adaptation technology is not uh, available yet. There is no adaptation technology for addressing loss and damage. For instance, salinity. For instance, uh, I mean, health problem with women. There is no adaptation uh, technology for, for addressing those. These are closely linked to human rights. So our concern is to make a standalone agenda item under the, uh, I mean, Paris Agreement, uh, including human concern, cultural concern, Human rights concern, so that loss and damage can be addressed in that in that way and in that political directives. The other concern was finance. When you talk about adaptation, when you talk about loss and damage, this is absolutely related to finance. And and you all know that uh, there are much political debate and also argument from the developing countries for uh, for realizing commitment of the developed countries annually, hundred billion US dollar from 2020. But uh, but developed country uh, said that. Uh, they are fulfilled around 80 billion US dollar uh, by different means, different instruments. And there are also many, uh, I mean, illicit instruments, because when we talk, when we say that, uh, I mean, loan is a climate finance, uh, ODA is climate finance, and also debt swap is climate finance, that does not qualify the uh, requirement of climate finance. That's why our concern at COP26 was that we should have a particular qualification. What does climate finance mean? And 
and climate finance should be additional to it. Climate finance should reach to the poor people. Climate finance not should tie to the tie to the conditionalities. Climate finance should not channel through the multilateral development bank because they are they they, they are not good in ensuring effective utilization of climate finance. The third issue was displacement and migration, and we know we all know that displacement and migration once upon a time it was under Cancun Agreement, uh, uh, Para Third, Para 14F. Then it has been integrated to loss and damage. So uh, in the course of time, loss and damage loss, and also displacement and migration is about to loss. So our concern is that displacement and migration is a serious concern for a country like Bangladesh and also other coastal countries, because in Bangladesh by 2030 or 2050, around 15 to 20 million people will be displaced and migrated. This is huge. And even in many countries, there is not as much as much as people that Bangladesh will receive as displaced or uprooted people. So this concern should be integrated to the climate change discourse and negotiation. So from Bangladesh perspective, when you talk about civil society perspective, there are three major concerns. One is financing loss and damage. Second is quality finance for adaptation, uh, not by doing, uh, I mean, loan and other, other instruments, and also how to address uh, loss and uh, displacement, displacement and migration with rights and entitlement of the climate change displaced and migrated people. Thank you. Thank you, Doha. Uh, Mihir. Yes. Um, let me add to uh, some Doha's uh, list of items that he has taken as a concern, but also takeaway in many ways. That uh, for us as the All India Disaster Mitigation Institute, we work very much on the ground and what is happening uh, to the day-to-day -day lives of the poor and vulnerable people. But the scale is more of a, 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 a pilot or a demonstration. And we take that knowledge and information to subnational, national, and global level. So my response, I would divide into two. One is at a global level, what is it that AIDMI will be engaged with in the coming past, so in the coming future, based on the takeaways which I will list. And second, at a national level, and India was a very important player in the COP26, as far as definitely the announcements and plans that were made, and was very actively supported by Canadian government and Anchorage to go under that path. Um, uh, um, some of the key global decisions that uh, I take away, and one of them is that various national governments were asked to republish their climate action plan. Uh, as a follow-up to COP26. And I think that's a huge opportunity. They've opened doors to things which would otherwise won't be open. So entire national plans will be republished. And before republishing, they would be reviewed and um, things will be added, rearranged and uh, changed. And that's an opening where AIDMI would very much like to make sure that um, um, the issues about labor and employment are added because currently the national plans don't include as much as we would like to that how national plans will add green jobs, for example, or clean skills, for example. And those are the things we would like to be added when this rearrangement and republishing is taking is going to take place in the next two years. So that's one item uh, very much. The second takeaway for us was to uh, that COP26 has encouraged uh, developed countries to go beyond US dollar 100 billion per year, though they haven't reached that, but the COP26 has encouraged them to go beyond 100 billion dollar per year. And what the IDMI would like and would like to do it with this is to uh, that we can demand that with the additional money beyond 100 billion dollars any additional dollar beyond that should first and directly first and directly i repeat should go to for clean and green work for the low income community so it should generate employment assets and it should generate finance for the low income communities 
especially I would like to mention women there, and I'm sure Megavan will elaborate on that. But that beyond $100 billion, that is something that should happen. The third major announcement global that I see is loss and damage. And Greg also mentioned that. And uh, loss and damage will now be more on agenda. And we may demand that loss and damage to not only the countries and economic entities, but also loss and damage to employment and skills and to people's assets that they own. What has happened to that and what is it that can be done so that that is compensated as well and not just large measurable monetized items that we are already aware of. So to give a very concrete example, that if a potter is making bricks and the bricks are not made anymore, then how his loss or damage will be compensated. Go that at a micro level to do that. And the last one, Corinne, and that is to say that uh, uh, climate finance is something which must be closely monitored and verified because climate finance is going to be very important between 26 and 20 and COP26 and COP27. So how do we very closely monitor and verify whether it is reaching to the poor, the climate affected communities, women, workers, but most importantly, those who are already taking action to adapt to changing climate, how that climate finance is reaching them. So that's the last point. Uh, so those four points are take away from global level. And that is where AIDMI globally would like to put its efforts to. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Megaben, would you like to answer this question? How, uh, what does COP26 mean for your organization? Uh, sure, Corinne Ben. Actually, uh, Mansi Ben will be joining soon. So if I'm taken last, so translation can happen. If not, then I can speak now. Uh, Gregoire, do you want to go ahead and answer? Um, thank you for, um, uh, for lending me the floor. Um, I guess, um, and first of all, maybe a, a bit of a caveat that typically we, um, and, and by we, I'd say mostly developed countries, um, but we, we don't like to divide countries into these two blocks of, of developed and developing, um, I think for two reasons. Um, and, and first is that it ignores the differences between the countries in each of those categories. Um, so you have quite a diversity of developed countries with different circumstances. And then you also have some, you know, so-called developing countries that are much richer than Canada um, and that are even more carbon intensive in their economies. And so when you sort of use those two blocks, we think it kind of lets those countries off the hook um, and countries that we think do have the capability to sort of do more on climate change, including on things like climate finance. Um, the second reason we don't like those sort of two rigid categories is that it also ignores distinctions within countries. And so uh, in any country, a richer person uh, produces or is responsible for a lot more greenhouse gases than a poorer person. And, and that's true in Canada uh, on about an order of magnitude, uh, perhaps two between a richer and a poorer person. And that's true in, in, in every country. And so when we use those two rigid categories, we're sort of letting certain people off the hook by virtue of where they, they live as opposed to what they, they do. Um, now that said, as Doha mentioned, the negotiations do sometimes break down along those lines. Um, and each, each country or country representative comes to a table with sort of a mandate. And that mandate usually has certain issues that they see as sort of priorities or, or opportunities for that country. And, and they have other issues that they see more as, as risks um, and, or, or things that they need to defend against. Um, and the, if, if you judge the outcome at a COP, you can't really say, well, did this block of countries win or did that block, block of countries win? Um, because it's not usually how it works. Rather, what usually happens is either everybody sort of wins on their priority issues and, and gives up their defensive issues, or 
everybody holds the line on their defensive issues and then wins less or gains less on the priority issues. So you have some cops that make a lot of progress in a balanced manner, and you have other cops that make very little progress in, in a balanced manner. But you typically always have that balance because the decisions are made by, by consensus. And so I think at this COP, um, it was actually pretty good progress. Um, and that there are certain issues um, such as adaptation finance or financing for loss and damage that my colleagues really gave up a lot of their red lines um, uh, in, in order to make progress. And similarly, there were other issues that, um, such as phasing out coal or phasing down coal was some of the words, or uh, some of the prohibitions on double counting in the Paris rule book, that it was other countries that really gave up their uh, uh, defensive positions and their red lines. And so in, in that respect, it was a good one, that when everybody is making concessions instead of holding the line, then that's usually a cop that made uh, uh, good progress. Um, but of course the challenge, and as we keep seeing progress, there's sometimes reason for optimism, but the effects of climate change are getting ever more real. And so it's almost like we're, we're in a, you know, on a bicycle that's driving towards a solid wall and we're hitting the brakes. We're, we're seeing ourselves slow down and saying, yeah, this is progress but the wall keeps getting closer. Um, and so that is, I always leave every cop thinking, well, hey, we, 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 we did do more than I expected, but we also, uh, the problem also just keeps getting bigger. Uh, thanks. Thank you. Um, uh, Mega Ben, I'm, I'm wondering if you are, I know that the translator isn't here yet, but we're, yeah. we're ready to, to move on here. Would you like to answer? Sure. So um, the biggest takeaway from COP26 uh, COP is a need to bring the informal sector women workers, uh, their role and their contribution as a custodians of biodiversity and climate change and bring to the decision level uh, bodies. So um, Seva has seen that women uh, conserves biodiversity and given access and awareness, they can become custodians. Thus, there is a need for inclusion in all the processes of COP, right from the country level uh, to the UN level, to form a suitable framework for policy and integrating social justice and climate action. Um, second is about, um, SEVA is also piloting, setting up of a microgrid using the um, idle panels of salt farms in LKR. Uh, during non-salt seasons. So this leads to localized electric electricity generation and distribution. So these kind of pilots um, owned by local women, um, uh, production and distribution should be um, expanded in other areas and it should be added in this kind of uh, mitigation uh, exercises. Uh, thirdly, I would like to say to address this kind of issues, there is a need to adopt decentralized, um, as I said, productions um, distribution, but together with that, um, the access to finance and um, the right kind of uh, technology, clean technology in hands of um, women and informal sector workers. Because currently we have seen that they are very expensive and um, we all know that majority of the women uh, do not have land on their own name, so they do not have access to finance. So special products should be made and given the policy should be framed, which help uh, women to get access to these kind of uh, technology in entire supply chain, right from the irrigation related technology to processing to distribution um, in the um, agriculture supply chain and to other um, livelihood activities where they are using the energy and even the home um, aspects like gas and all these things. Um, secondly, um, lastly, I would say that um, as I said, the finance. So in that, um, there is a need to set up um, financial um, uh, fund 
uh, which can, uh, I can say that um, finance and investment, which aligns with the local needs and in order uh, that the financial uh, is accessible and affordable to the poor and women workers, and especially in the global south, there's a need to set up a SDG enabled fund. So from that, the organizations, the community-based organization, women's organization can have access to the funds, which is affordable. Um, women are ready to take loan, but it should be affordable and as per their own um, payment facility. So it may be a combination of grants, soft loans, patient capitals, and that would guarantee funds and uh, security to the poor women workers, which is uh, accessible for a nano, tiny, and micro enterprises of the women in the informal sector. So um, I'll end here, and uh, I hope that this all uh, processing uh, processes and supports brings the um, the efforts and the contribution of uh, women workers, and that helps them to be part of the process of the decision making. As I said, right from the country to the UN level. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think that I'll turn it over to the audience now, to the attendees. And I, I think that I'll ask um, Gregoire to address this first question. Who is officially monitoring the climate issues at the global level? If the countries don't take responsive measures regarding climate issue and reduction of CO2, what steps will be taken against these countries? It's a great question. Um, so the the UNFCCC went through, I guess, different phases in its in its history um, in terms of how to deal with that that transparency climate issue. So how to track what what everyone is doing uh, in relation to their commitments, and then also what carrots and sticks they might have to sort of get countries to do what they what they ought to do, um, and so. The, the biggest criticism or one of the biggest criticisms of the Paris Agreement is that everybody's national target is determined by the country. Um, and it's on that country's honor, I guess, to ensure that their, their targets reflect their highest possible ambition. Um, and then also achieving a target is not, you know, legally required. Um, and so that's sort of the two pieces saying, well, who's really, you know, making them do things. Um, and, and the reason for this is essentially it's, it's international law and that um, you can't impose an obligation on a country unless they've accepted that obligation by treaty. Um, and so the, we will only get as much uh, you know, stringency as countries are willing to agree to, including countries that are afraid that they, you know, uh, the commitments they make they might not have the ability to implement them. Um, so it is a bit of a delicate balance and we don't really have the climate police that will take countries or businesses to climate jail for having too high of commitments, um, at least not at the international level. So instead what we did um, that it's basically a, it's a pledge and reporting cycle with a strategic use of peer pressure in between. And so you have pledges that, that countries make um, and that uh, both individually and collectively. Um, so you have individual emissions pledges, you have collective finance pledges, you have collective temperature goals and collective mitigation pathways, you have individual finance pledges and so on. Um, and those typically happen on a five-year cycle. And then every two years, each country must report on sort of what they've done in relation to those pledges. And those are subject to uh, peer review, which makes recommendations on how to improve uh, their reporting. Um, and then finally, you have something called the global stock take. And that's sort of a, a collective uh, review of, okay, what did we as a global community set out to do with the Paris Agreement? And how far have we gotten? And, and what do we have left to do? Um, and so that's built into this five-year cycle of the Paris Agreement in every year that ends in a three or an eight. And so the first global stock take will be in 2023, 
where we'll look at how things have come since the Paris Agreement entered into action in 20, like I guess 2021, um, and every five years thereafter. And then the outcomes of those global stock takes are to inform that next round of pledges in, in 2025. So we certainly won't solve it all in one year. And the Paris Agreement alone does not solve these massive problems that are climate change. But the objective of the agreement is this sort of self-renewing, you know, uh, always enhancing what they call the ambition cycle. It's like a ratchet that it always moves forward but never slips back. Um, and the idea is that every five years we ratchet up our ambition and we ratchet up our implementation so that by mid-century we are at that net zero and climate resilient uh, space. Um, so I guess Who's monitoring everything? Well, you know, uh, they're, each country is monitoring itself um, and that is subject to peer review, but also there are these collective um, review uh, and, and collective uh, progress uh, assessments um, in the global stock take that happen uh, once every five years, starting in 2023. Thanks. Thanks, Gregoire. Um, one question that we have uh, from the attendees is from uh, Professor Larry Slotak at University of Waterloo. He says, adaptation seems twofold to me, adapting to the changing climate and adapting to the fact that the most powerful actors in the world are not acting in our collective interest. Can the panelists please speak to civil society strategies of engagement that in their opinion are effective in moving states and corporations in positive directions. And uh, Doha, Bai, I'd like to turn it over to you to perhaps answer that first. Thank you very much. And this is a very great question, in fact. This is not only the, uh, I mean, powerful corporations and actors, this is also powerful country. And if we take example from last COP, the powerful country, what we uh, figure out or put finger, this is USA. And USA only blocks uh, climate change negotiation in terms of loss and damage. Again, the emerging powerful country, uh, if, I, if I name India and China, they, they, they're successful to introduce phase, up, phase down instead of phase out. So uh, this is not only the corporations, but also the powerful states. Concern is that the powerful states are protecting the rights of, or protecting, protecting the injustice of powerful, uh, I mean, uh, corporations. And uh, many countries, uh, uh, in many countries, states are dominated by corporates, corporations. But again, uh, the civil societies of the world, uh, they are very active, uh, I, I should say. And if I look back to the recent civil society movements, particularly movements organized by youth group, uh, this is huge. And this is very a tremendous impact on, on national negotiation process. And if I cite an example from last COP, uh, civil society participation was not that good because that was very restriction and access of civil societies are being restricted uh, increasingly, not only in global, global processes, but also national processes. But again, uh, there are huge movements, civil society movement, and uh, initially uh, the country parties only try to say that civil, civil societies are NGOs, and the civil societies are maybe like can platform, can international, and other actual lines. But in COP26, I found civil society from across the sectors, from uh, academicians, from students, from businessmen. So. So all are concerned on our, uh, about our future and even the political leaders. Political leaders, when they speak so, uh, in the last plenary, they become emotional and they, they provided very sentimental state, not only for us, for the future generation. They also refer that this is our grandson, our granddaughter. So what are, uh, we are living for, for him or her? So this kind of appeal is, is coming from, uh, from the political leaders and civil societies are successful for convincing the political leaders in that in, in that way. And uh, again, uh, we need to work hard because you now when you talk about corporations, corporations always try to find out their own own interest and, and civil societies alone cannot 
create much pressure on the corporations because this is the big powerful. Sometimes corporations play more powerful than the state. So the civil society, academicians, uh, uh, and business, and also state, I mean, um, other states, uh, they also can work together to create pressure on the corporations so that they become green, they become pretty clean, and they adapt to the future scenario of climate change. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm just wondering, actually, if you can speak to what civil society is doing in your country specifically. Oh, in, in, in our country, civil society also doing great work uh, because uh, this is not only really campaigning and also to, to uh, take out right issues to the policy stakeholders. Civil society also implementing a number of projects community-based projects for uh, supporting communities in terms of adaptation and resilience building. Civil society is also trying to come up with the, with the ideas, uh, alternative ideas on adaptation and also how to, uh, how to ensure more benefits or adaptation benefits to the climate vulnerable communities. Again, there are some problems with our country also. There are limited space for, uh, I mean, uh, expressing our voice or expressing our opinion. And there are also other, other issues related to ineffectiveness of uh, ineffective utilization of climate finance, corruption, governance. Still, civil society is trying to uh, communicate people's biases to the national policy stakeholders. Thank you uh, very much. Um, I'd like to move over to me here. Uh, can you tell us about how, what civil society uh, is doing in your country uh, to address this? And also what types of um, kind of, uh, what types of strategies of engagement can civil society uh, undertake uh, to move the states and corporations in positive directions? Sure, sure. And uh, please take this with the thought in mind that uh, Indian civil society is huge and is extremely diverse and rightly so, and would be impossible to sum up or represent the views that the civil society has. My window is uh, more closer to the overlap between disaster risk and climate risk one. And keeping that in mind, I'll tell you what the civil society is doing. Uh, first area where, where there is a lot of work that is uh, being planned and done, as I understand from friends and colleagues we work with, is the non-fossil fuel energy capacity. That how is it that that capacity could be built so that we don't have to keep on arguing and we move on to non-fossil fuel energy rapidly and radically fast. The second area where a lot of work is happening, not enough, but a lot of work is being pushed either in terms of advocacy, in terms of studies, in terms of actual implementation as Mega Ben has uh, quite shown us directly, to me, uh, is to meet uh, uh, the energy requirement with renewable energy. So all new energy requirements, at least half of it, if not more, should be met with renewable energy. And that's an area where a lot of work is being planned and uh, not enough again, but that's the one direction also that is being taken by the civil society. The third area is to reduce the projected carbon emissions. So those which are high carbon emission activities, enterprises, operations, what is it that can be done from transportation sector to construction sector to manufacturing, so on and so forth, to reduce the carbon emission? And that's a third area where a lot of uh, work um, is done and is being done. Again, not enough at all. The fourth area where civil society is actively working is to reduce the carbon intensity of the economy itself. So how do we make the economy greener and cleaner, not only at a national level, but at a domestic level as well. To give you an example, that if I'm earning 100 rupees right now, and that 100 rupees are coming from brown economy, or uh, um, uh, uh, then how do I have at least 50% of my income from green, in, uh, green 
economy coming in. That's a new area where a lot of new models are being proposed, uh, economic models, environmental models, ecological models. And the last one is this whole idea of net zero emission. And everybody wants somebody else to reach the net zero emission first. So how do we start the charity begins at home? And similarly, net zero emission also begins at home. But what is it that we as civil society can do with the communities and people? So we start reducing the net zero emission, not to at all condone or not to at all put aside the fact that the way a lot of countries in, and a lot of sectors are developing is harmful to climate um, uh, change related effort that we are making. And that must be stopped and reduced. Um, so keeping that in mind. So that's what is happening from my vintage point. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mega Ben, I'm, I'm going to ask you to speak about the role that civil society is taking in, in your country, but also specifically, uh, can you suggest some climate resilient models which can help farmers and women? Um, from uh, G2 Thomas, uh, I think that that's a good question for you to answer. Sure, thank you. So I'll uh, share our experience at SEVA, what we do. Uh, so basically we work on the three aspects. As I said, the visibility of women as uh, custodians of biodiversity, which can help reduce and mitigate the climate risk. So uh, to showcase that, as I said, we need to provide access um, of these uh, pilots to the women. So on one side, we are doing that, that how we can provide the access to these technologies and then do pilots and then the studies are done and the learnings that we try to bring to the platforms at local level, at uh, national level, as well as at international level and in the side events done by the UN or, or the World Bank and all. So how the contribution of women in these aspects can be seen and people can start thinking about how we can bring the women's role in that. Second aspect is about how the uh, climate resilient uh, practices as well as the contributions. So when I said we provide the, uh, we help them to link to the clean uh, technologies uh, for their productive use for their home. But together with that, we also try to um, convert and repurpose the supply chains to localize supply chains, decentralized supply chains. So the larger emission, which is done through the transport and all can also be reduced and how the local communities can use uh, the produce that is uh, produced within the um, 10 uh, kilometers of uh, circle. So how uh, that, that's how we can reduce emission. The third aspect is uh, about uh, we provide capacity building trainings um, and um, the exposures to the women farmers to how they can convert from the usage of the chemical pesticides and fertilizers to the uh, natural uh, fertilizers and pesticides. And from learning, they can start uh, using it and we also provide them training on how to make them uh, by themselves. So I think these are the areas. And the uh, last aspect is about the, there is a larger plantation program by our members that how they can through plantation work. And that is uh, taken up um, at our Haryali campaign, as I said, that covers mainly all these aspects which can help address uh, the challenges of the um, carbon emission, uh, climate change impacts. And I think these are the areas. One is on action on ground to demonstrate the pilots. And second is about how um, we can bring the contributions. And third is about how that's how we can do something for the um, women of informal sector and their enterprises. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to have a uh kind of a, a quick lightning round of, 
of questions right now. I would like each of the panelists to uh, answer one question that I see my friend and colleague Imran has, a, has asked, is the net zero a false narrative? And I'm gonna combine that question with, uh, or steps that you believe need to be taken for your organization, how you will prepare for COP27. And I think that I'll ask Doha to start, to start uh, this round. Yes, thank you very much. Net zero, I mean, uh, if you don't implement anything, this is, this is also false. So we can say that net zero is false, but net zero also has some, some kind of, uh, I mean, implication because net zero does something, does mean something. So if we could achieve this stage, net zero stage by 2050, uh, and we need to, for net zero emission, we need to go for decarbonization, um, I mean, fossil fuel phase out, and also divestment from the uh, and, and fossil fuel, uh, phasing out coal. So we have to go through this process. So, uh, I mean, net zero emission is not a false solution, uh, but we have to be honest for achieving this, this target. This is my concern. If we are uh, if we don't fulfill our commitment, then again, this is this will be a fa false solution. Um, maybe I forgot the another concern or question. Uh, how you will be preparing for COP twenty seven? How your organization is oh. preparing? Oh, this is very important, and this is a very great concern uh, in Bangladesh. You know that Bangladesh we have a diverse civil society group, and there are also emerging youth group, uh, mid level professionals. So. What we do, we try to develop the skills and capacities, not in terms of addressing climate change or GRR, but also understand the, I mean, uh, impacts of, of climate change in different dimension, as I mentioned earlier, the secondary impact, and also uh, impacts of climate change, women, children, uh, disadvantaged community groups. So we want to build their capacity in terms of understanding and knowledge, and also build their capacity in terms of uh, understanding different negotiation streams because different negotiation streams are coming up. Uh, for instance, human rights-based approach. And, and we also integrate local adaptation plans uh, because countries are developing local adaptation, national adaptation plan. And also we need to update our uh, nationally determined contribution so that civil societies understand the process and can effectively involve in the process to sensitize our national government. In terms of next COP, Yes, uh, uh, enhancing nationally determined contribution is a big task because if we fail to do this, uh, we cannot align even to 1.8 degrees centigrade, let alone 1.5 degrees centigrade. And our target is to align to 1.5 degrees centigrade. The second one is uh, adaptation uh, communication or, or how to make, uh, because you know that there are, uh, what program has been established at of uh, 26, this is on global goal on adaptation. So we need, need to monitor uh, the tasks and the requirement of global goal on adaptation and, and the work of work program. The third is again talking about climate governance uh, in terms of uh, I mean directing more funds to the to the climate vulnerable communities and governance institutional embedding in addressing climate change. So our concern towards COP27 is not only international, but also national level, because we consider climate change is now implementation stage. So we need to ensure effective and timely implementation of activities to address climate change. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, me hereby, uh, do you think that that net zero achieving that is an illusion uh, or not? And how is your organization preparing for uh, COP27? Yeah, um, that's a, that's a um, tricky question. And um, yeah, I think net zero can very easily be used to to uh, guide the whole discussion in certain direction, if perhaps even misguide the direction in certain um, certain direction where it is not beneficiary for 
the countries which are really struggling to develop economically, socially, to have uh, basic services for their citizens, etc. Uh, so I think the net zero can be a bit more realistic than false narrative if we look at net zero at country level, but also net zero at citizen level. And that is that if you are a person 28 years of age, and if you don't, don't have a job, and if you take up a job in coal mining, it's not your responsibility to be you know, doing net zero. So we, he needs a job and he needs to support his family. Or it could be a lady um, also looking for a um, head load of coal taking from one place to another. Um, so, um, so I think we have to at attain both net zero in terms of emission, but net zero poverty simultaneously that basic needs of all the citizens uh, should be addressed irrespective of uh, any other uh, aspect of that. And unless that is achieved, net zero in terms of employment, net zero in terms of poverty, and then net zero in terms of emission, I think that is something which makes net zero less false narrative and more realistic. So that's on net zero, but this needs more thinking and more uh, work and more brains behind this. And Cody is very well placed to do that. I'm sure they'll do it in the um, coming weeks and months to do. For COP, uh, for COP27, what we are looking at is, um, as I said before, that uh, one is how before COP27, how the countries are able to present their republish plan with more focus on green jobs and clean skills and how that is part of that. We are also looking for making efforts to make sure that the uh, 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 loss and damage doesn't only talk about loss and damage in terms of money, but also talks about loss and damage in terms of uh, uh, employment and skills that is taking place because of, uh, uh, so that's the second aspect. And third is climate finance, that how that finance could be transformative so that we um, not end up in a same cycle again, but we actually break away from this cycle where cutting trees, for example, is more lucrative than planting trees. So how do we you know, have finance which actually allows us to make planting trees a lucrative business or harvesting water a lucrative business? And that is something uh, we want to push for COP27. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mega Ben, uh, do you think that net zero is an illusion? And how is uh, Sewa preparing for COP27? Um, so um, I would say that I'm not an expert uh, in that aspect. But uh, at SEVA, what we have learned from that, we can say that um, if given a suitable framework for policy on integrating social justice and climate action, maybe uh, that can help uh, us to um, achieve that. That's what I can say. But as Greg Bai say that uh, pressure is also one of the monitoring criteria and that may also uh, may have helped us to, um, I mean, the, about the net zero aspect. Um, second aspect of uh, how we are preparing uh, as a country uh, to achieve the, um, uh, our visibility, I mean, the informal sector women's visibility at COP27. So um, there are four areas uh, that we are working. Um, so one is about how uh, we can um, make understand our members about what is COP and how um, we can help them to um, uh, understand and walk towards that, how their um, work contributes towards um, this COP26, that is one. So whole entire aspect of awareness building and both ways. Uh, COP to members and members what say to, um, to bring to the level to the policy makers. Uh, second is about um, entire capacity build building program that how 
we can train youth of informal sector over the green jobs and the access third is our aspect was about climate finance aspect where um, the informal sector women and their enterprises can have access to the finance to adopt to the green um, livelihoods and jobs based on the trainings given. And um, the fourth aspect is about uh, with all these, what we do, we can how at national level, local level, um, negotiate with the government to bring women in these entire crop processes. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Megaben. Uh, at this point, uh, I am going to conclude the uh, the session. But I first want to let you know that they I will be facilitating a course in the winter uh, for the Cody Institute, and we will discuss many of the topics that we've talked about here today. Uh, we will start with the science of uh, climate change, and then we will move into the uh, international government policies around climate change. We will talk about climate as a human rights issue from a gender lens. And uh, we will talk about how uh, some adaptation strategies that, that communities are using, how communities are using their own assets, uh, strengths and knowledge to address the impacts of climate change in their communities. And so there are bursaries available through the Cody Institute. And I encourage you to check the Cody website for more information. I would love to have you join the course. Um, it's a great way of getting to know what's happening in various countries around the world and to develop a, a cohort of colleagues working and concerned about these issues. And with that said, I would like to sincerely thank our esteemed panelists today. And I, I wish you all the best as we as we move into December and and all the best for the new year. So thank you very much for attending everyone. And I hope that you enjoy the rest of your day, whether it's nighttime or morning, wherever you are in the world. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you. Namaste. Thank you so much. Thank you. Merci beaucoup.